Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Justice Powered by Information and Action webinar series presented by the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. Today's discussion will focus on the law of parties, with representatives from the legal, media, and activism community participating in what we hope will be educational and motivational dialogue. This webinar series is brought to you by the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty which for 42 years has been a key leader and builder in the movement to abolish the United States death penalty. NCADP operates on two distinct tracks. One, we provide technical assistance to Capital Defense Council that saves lives. As we know, fewer death sentences shows a growing consensus that capital punishment is inconstitutional and creates an environment that gives states, legislatures, and courts grounds to abolish the death penalty. We also operate on our Justice Powered by Information and Action program, JPIA, which mobilizes and form grassroots action to take action against the death penalty. The webinar, like you'll be seeing today, hopes to educate and mobilize the entire nation to end the inhumane practice that is the death penalty and institute programs and policies that actually increase public safety. Now, at the end of the webinar, I'm going to be giving you some action items that you're going to be able to help out with us so we can find some different ways that we can spread the word on the need to abolish the death penalty. But before we start, we wanted to share with you a little bit of a message from Kenneth Foster. As you know, Kenneth Foster is currently sitting on death row, and he had a very special message for the community who's come here today about his case, about the law of parties, and how you might be able to get activated to help end the law of parties and advocate further for more uh, abolition of the death penalty. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Kenneth Foster. Hello and greetings to everybody that's participating in this webinar today. My name is Kenneth Foster, Jr. I was convicted in 1997 as an accomplice to a crime. Um, I was basically sent to death row for being a getaway driver. Uh, in 2007, my sentence was commuted uh, by Governor Perry, but only in his tenure. And since then, we have been trying to uh, bring attention to the law of parties. Um, today, I would like to point out four issues that I feel are very important that I would like for people in this webinar to consider and think about and work on in your own private time, and hopefully this information shared can be used to bring the change in sentences that we need. Number one, that's the root of the statute. In 1974, when this statute was created, 7.02b, there was no death penalty. Therefore, we would assume that the individuals that created this never intended for it to be used for a death penalty case because the death penalty did not exist. The death penalty didn't return until 1976. The second issue is the discrepancy of the application. Um, why are individuals that committed an actual murder allowed to plea bargain for a lesser time? And then the individual that did not commit the murder, we can go to trial and be given a death or life sentence. We feel like that is, it, it's unjust. Um, the third issue is Governor Abbott and the connotation that he extended to Thomas Whitaker earlier this year in 2018. We're very thankful for that connotation, but the question is, what's the difference between Thomas Whitaker and the other individuals that are on death row that never killed anybody? Currently, we have 10 names of 10 individuals that are on death row in Texas that never killed anybody. We would like to ask Governor Abbott to extend his compassion and his commutation to these other 10 individuals. If Thomas Whitaker is worthy of a commutation, then so are these 10 other men that never committed a murder. And then the fourth issue is Texas needs to catch up with California. California has the largest death row, and it also has the largest prison population. We're very thankful that California finally passed a bill that will not allow individuals who didn't kill them to be convicted of a felony murder. They will no longer be given a death sentence or a life sentence. They will be sentenced accordingly to their lives. We would like for the politicians in California to build bridges with the politicians in Texas.
Hello and greetings to everybody that's participating. It's unjust. Um, the third issue. Hello and greetings to everybody that's participating in this webinar today. Uh, my name is Kenneth Foster Jr. I was convicted in 1997 as an accomplice to a crime. Um, I was basically sent to death row for being a getaway driver. Uh, in 2007, my sentence was commuted uh, by Governor Perry, but only in his tenure. And since then, we have been trying to uh, bring attention to the law parties. Um, today, I would like to point out four issues that I feel are very important that I would like for people in this webinar to consider, think about, and work on in your own private time. And hopefully, this information shared can be used to bring the change in sentences that we need. Number one, that's the root of the statute. In 1974, when this statute was created, 7.02b, there was no death penalty. Therefore, we would assume that the individuals that created this never intended for it to be used for a death penalty case because the death penalty did not exist. The death penalty didn't return until 1976. The second issue is the discrepancy of the application. Um, why are individuals that committed an actual murder allowed to plea bargain for a lesser time? And then the individual that did not commit the murder, he can go to trial and be given a death or life sentence. We feel like that is, it's unjust. Um, the third issue is Governor Abbott and the connotation that he extended to Thomas Whitaker earlier this year in 2018. We're very thankful for that connotation, but the question is, what's the difference between Thomas Whitaker and the other individuals that are on death row that never killed anybody? Currently, we have 10 names of 10 individuals that are on death row in Texas that never killed anybody. We would like to ask Governor Abbott to extend his compassion and his commutation to these other 10 individuals. If Thomas Whitaker is worthy of a commutation, then so are these 10 other men that never committed a murder. And then the fourth issue is Texas needs to catch up with California. California has the largest death row and it also has the largest prison population. We're very thankful that California finally passed a bill that will not allow individuals who didn't kill to be convicted of a felony murder. They will no longer be given a death sentence or a life sentence. They will be sentenced accordingly to their crime. We would like for the politicians in California to build bridges with the politicians in Texas Well, thank you very much uh, to Kenneth Foster for relaying that message for all of us. And thank you, Daniel Gross, who I'll be introducing shortly for facilitating this dialogue. Um, welcome back to our webinar on the law of parties. Uh, we have a very uh, distinguished panel of, of experts here to talk about a range of issues that affect this um, from the death penalty perspective. Uh, I'd like to first introduce Madula Rahman. Uh, she is a criminal defense and capital defense attorney out of Phoenix. Part of a large, awesome team that is helping to save the life of Joseph Garcia, who, if you do not know, has an execution date of December 4th, um, which is Tuesday. So we are uh, rantly running uh, out of time. Thank you, Merdula, for, for spending some time with us. Um, also, we have Daniel A. Gross, who is a culture and criminal justice writer whose work has appeared in The New Yorker and the BBC World Service. And you can also catch his audio recordings on NPR and 99% Invisible. Um, there should be a little button that says turn on. Um, so let's get this started. Let's get this conversation on the way. Um, as I re referenced before, um, Joseph Garcia's execution date is now less than a week away. Um, Radula, you're in contact with Mr. Garcia. Um, maybe you can just give our, our, our audience just a little um, update on his state of mind and how he's holding up underneath this tremendous pressure. Um, he's holding up pretty well, given the amount of stress he's facing. Uh, the Joseph we've gotten to know over the years is a very charismatic person. He's engaging. He's a great storyteller with a great sense of humor. Um, we're sadly seeing a little bit less of that. He's a, I mean, you can see a bone deep sadness when you talk to him, um, but we still see some flashes of his sense of humor. Um, he's taking a great deal of strength right now from his religion, from his faith. And he's also deeply, deeply appreciative of the support from folks like the people listening in today. Uh, it's giving him a great deal of solace and comfort in this very difficult time. But, so he thanks you. Well, we thank him for being a strong pillar of hope. 
and for really letting us be able to raise his voice and his plight to the masses. So um, uh, we're, we're glad that you're working on his behalf and we're all hoping for a positive outcome in the next couple of days. Uh, Daniel, um, thank you so much for, uh, for opening up and allowing us to, to hear from Kenneth, who is extremely sincere and it probably encapsulates exactly uh, how brutal this law is. Um, I know he walked through a range of things that he was talking about. Um, do you want to address some of the situations and some of the comments that he had made and maybe expand the panel? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. I mean, I, mean, I think uh, Kenneth was, was the person who let me know about this webinar in, in the first place. Um, and I think he really felt that um, the um, the illogic of the law parties had to be had to be explained from someone on the inside, someone who's experienced it himself. Um, he he wanted to uh, share a particular court case uh, that he sent to me. Um, it's it's called Nava versus State, um, and I believe we will be able to send a link to the people who are listening today. Um, and you know what struck Kenneth and what he passed on to me is that in that um, in that court case the judge uh, takes the time to say, you know, I agree with the, with the finding in this case, but I have some concerns about the law of parties. Um, and what the judge says, um, just pulling it up here. Sorry, just give me a moment. And we'll be posting uh, a link to this case in the chat box towards the end of the webinar so everyone can get a, uh, to take a look at it. And while Daniel is looking um, for the court case or looking for the passage that he wants to share, I encourage everyone who's on the chat to please send in your questions. Um, you can just type your questions directly into the chat box and uh, we'll try to get to them uh, um, as explicitly as possible. So the judge in that case wrote that the 1974 code, so we're talking about 702B, which is the law of parties, painted the conspiracy concept with a broad brush and took the type of vicarious responsibility that once applied only to felony murder co-felons and applied it to the unintended commission of any felony. So 702B broadened um, this idea of vicarious responsibility. Um, in my in the story that I wrote about Daniel, we're having a little trouble hearing you on this end. I know that we talked about this pre, so I don't know if there's a button on there that has you muted. Um, but we're, I, I think there are people in the audience who are not if being. I can get nice and close to the mic. Does that help at all? Um, let me see. Um, go ahead, and I'm sure that my producer will tell me yes or no. So we go ahead and move that. Getting a little closer to the mic, seeing if that if that helps. Testing things. I can hear you perfectly, but I'm hearing that some people on the chat are having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, if you can just speak up maybe in, uh, okay. in that voice as, uh, as some okay. people are, are, are recommending you do. I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Um, so so what I guess I, what I wanted to relay from Kenneth is that um, he, he was pointing out that, that this judge himself recognized that the law parties expanded the, the, the idea of responsibility uh, past where it previously was to the point that um, you could be held responsible for the actions of someone else. Uh, and so in the story that I, that I wrote about Kenneth, I had a lot of trouble explaining this to an audience that had never incur encountered the law of parties. How do you explain the idea that someone can be convicted for something that they themselves did not do? And I think that, um, that confusion, that difficulty in explaining what the law of parties is, reflects the kind of roundabout nature of this law. And thank you so much. This is all great. And um, yeah, uh, just maybe uh, do one of these things on the next uh, question. We might be able to hear you. Uh, we've got a tremendous uh, amount of feedback coming here for the chat. I just want to take a second to thank everyone for coming in here. Uh, we've got people all the way from New Zealand. We have Japan. We have Ohio. Uh, we have Israel. We have Arizona. Uh, we have Switzerland. We have Detroit. We got the UK. We have Tennessee. We got Washington, D.C., Texas, uh, all coming here to listen to this very important conversation. And why not hear from back on? Um, so the one person who we can speak and hear from <laughs> 
uh, is Merdula. And um, so, you know, as we know, as we said earlier, we are coming up on uh, a couple days. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of where his case stands um, with, with regards to the existing court cases and any challenges that you're going to be raising over the next couple of days? Sure. Um, we currently have litigation pending in state court regarding Joseph's capital case. Um, we are challenging his death sentence before the Court of Criminal Appeals right now, and we're challenging it on numerous grounds, um, including that the state, when arguing for the death penalty, the, the state misled the jury about Joseph's prior conviction. And so what happened in this case is Joseph and six other men escaped from prison and were involved in an armed robbery during which a police officer died. Um, so the state presented evidence about Joseph's prior conviction, the reason he was in prison in the first place, and that evidence was misleading. We are also arguing that um, in, in the instance where you have someone who neither killed nor intended to kill, which is Joseph's case, that the Eighth Amendment, the, uh, the federal constitution does not allow execution any longer. So sort of the topic here, which is you shouldn't be executing people who are convicted solely based on the law of parties. Um, and we have a number of other challenges. It, if we are not successful in state court, we will be bringing suit in federal court. Um, and we also have a pending clemency application. So and we expect a decision on that on Friday. Can you so, describe what that, what that application is? Sure. Um, in Texas, what we do is we submit an application to the seven person board of pardons and paroles, and then they make a recommendation to the governor and you need a majority vote to make that recommendation and they'll recommend to the governor. Uh, yes, grant clemency or no, don't grant clemency. A clemency would be in this case, a commutation of his Joseph's sentence to life, um, life imprisonment. If the clemency board does not recommend the grant of clemency, the governor has no power to do, to, to commute the sentence. And the application itself, it talks a lot about Joseph's really difficult history. He has a past that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. Um, his mom got addicted to heroin when he was very young, so he was just off on his own. Uh, he became the the main caretaker for his yeah, her, his baby sister when she was diagnosed with cancer as a young age. She was the only person um, who really loved him and she died when he was young and he just had no stability in his life. And then uh, he did fairly well for himself or he did the best he could, but then just sort of the trauma of his childhood caught up with him and he ended up uh, uh, committing, you know, uh, acting in self-defense and then ending up in prison and then he ended up uh, with the Texas Seven and getting the capital case that is now before us. So we have a very interesting comment from Sherry Good. Um, I'm not sure where Sherry is from, but a very interesting comment. And I think it kind of dovetails nicely into the conversation, into the question that I want to ask Daniel. Uh, Sherry writes on September 26th of this year, the district court, I'm not sure where, uh, unfortunately reconfirmed that despite, quote, the troubling possibility of Richard, excuse me, Robert Will's actual innocence, unquote, under the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, this court did not have the jurisdiction to consider Rob's petition for a mo emergency motion for relief. And I think this kind of takes into place like we sometimes are not seeing these individuals as individuals that they're just incarcerated people that don't have any feelings, that don't have any people who care for them. And I know, Daniel, you've been very close in working with with, uh, with with Kenneth and in your criminal justice reporting. And I know there's a lot of people on the on the stream today who have been working with Kenneth, who know Kenneth. Um, can you just speak about the humanity that these people have and how our criminal justice system seems to last and to, seems to kind of lack to be able to see the actual people? Absolutely, um, and I'm going to speak really loud to see if uh, see if that helps at all. Um, one of the one of the early conversations that I had with Kenneth, I was walking home from the supermarket, and um, I was going to say, "Call me back, Kenneth. We'll talk when I'm home." And he said, "Tell me what you're tell me what you're carrying home from the supermarket." And I told him I had a box of strawberries on the top of the bag, and he said, "Wow, you know, I miss strawberries." And you know, those kinds of moments happen all the time when reporting on criminal justice. And it's not the kind of detail that necessarily makes it into a story, but it, that has always stuck with me. That was years ago. And I think in storytelling about incarcerated people, 
those are the types of details that can humanize a person who has had their humanity taken away. Another you know, story that comes to mind is I was interviewing someone in South Carolina who uh, we, were, we were speaking through an, a, a contraband cell phone. And he told me that um, every morning he uses his cell phone to uh, brush his teeth with his daughter. And that's their ritual every single day. And that's their moment when they get to look at each other and be together while he's incarcerated. I, I think that th those kinds of details are often missed in the legal processes. Um, and they're really important. They, they, they can do a lot to bring the humanity back. Absolutely. Our, our good friend Waverly Miles says on the chat that Kenneth told her that the first thing he wants to eat when he gets out is a bowl of fruit. Uh, and yes, it is crazy on what we take for granted. Um, on the outside. It's true. Um, Radula, let's go back to you. I think we uh, we were having a tough time with Joanne. Let's, <laughs> we lost her. Um, so um, let, let's go back to you. Uh, do you feel, um, you know, executing someone not proven to be responsible for murder constitutes a violation under the constitutional standard of cruel and unusual punishment? Um, I do feel that it's unconstitutional and we are making that argument in court. Um, so the Eighth Amendment, it bans cruel and unusual punishment as everybody here knows, and it's not a, a fixed or static concept. It takes its meaning, this ban, um, and it evolves as our society matures. So something that was cruel and unusual or that wasn't cruel and unusual, you know, a hundred years ago may be cruel and unusual now. And we're seeing that states are are pretty at a pretty quick pace abandoning the death penalty altogether. And we're seeing that even in states with the death penalty, um, more of them are requiring a showing of premeditation or intent to kill or being the actual killer uh, before you can subject to the, the perpetrator to a death sentence. So we have this consensus across states that um, you shouldn't be allowing capital punishment for someone who neither killed nor intended to kill. And that helps inform the Eighth Amendment standard. And I think the other consideration here that courts do take into account is that the uh, capital punishment in this situation serves no purpose. You can't, you can't deter someone for a crime that he didn't commit and he didn't intend to commit. And when you're talking about retribution, like, are we really saying that someone who neither intended to kill anybody else and who did not kill anybody else is among the most culpable and deserving of execution? I think that's a real stretch. So I think we're at a point now where it is unconstitutional and I'm just waiting for a court to agree with me on that one. It so. is it is a weird way to say that you are trying to deter crime for punishing right. someone who did not actually commit the crime. Um, that you're punishing them for. Exactly. Uh, in, in Kenneth's message, Daniel, and I'll, I'll throw this out to both of you, uh, he had mentioned that there was uh, an, an issue with regard to the application of the law parties, um, that how can somebody um, take a plea bargain who actually committed the murder and then someone who did not commit the murder be executed? Um, I was just wondering, do you find that there's any sort of racial bias with regard to this application of the law parties? Are we seeing it come down heavier on people of color as we see with the entire death penalty? Or um, I guess, fortunately, is it being called straight, I guess, for, for lack of a better phrase? Jenna, go ahead. Um, yeah, I guess my, my initial reaction, which is maybe less, um, less informed than yours, Medulla, um, is that the same racial bias that you see across the mass incarceration system is reflected in the law of parties and in death row, particularly in Texas. Um, and I, I seem to remember that um, roughly the same proportion of, of people um, on death row are African American as in the rest of the prison system. So there's definitely over representation with African Americans. I think that's right. I actually haven't dealt with the law of parties in a ton of cases, but we see racial bias emerge in just every aspect of our criminal justice system and especially capital punishment. And I can't imagine it's different here. Certainly I have a non-white client who had a white judge and a, a jury of all white people and a white prosecutor who prosecuted him under this law and he was sentenced to death. Um, and I also think 
the kind of other point that Kenneth got to there was that, you know, when you have, when you know the prosecutor has a strong case against you um, because you're maybe the actual killer, you're going to be the first person to flip and you're going to go and talk to the prosecutor and say, I know you have a strong case against me. I will take whatever plea. I will plead to a life plead to a life sentence. Whereas when the prosecutor has a much weaker case, they need the the killer to testify against you. They need the additional evidence, and so you don't get a chance to get that plea offer. You you're stuck, and you're going to be the one who's subject to the death penalty at the end of the day, even when you weren't necessarily or you were definitely not the most culpable person involved. Absolutely. And don't forget, uh, audience, if you have a question for our two esteemed panelists, and maybe we'll get Joanne back, please send it over to the chat area. Our good friends um, over uh, in our friends of Randy Halpern um, reminds us that in the case of the Texas Seven, who um, Joseph falls into, three men have already been executed. Right. Um, and so it seems purely vengeance by the state of Texas that are punishing uh, they're pushing to execute the remaining three, and it is absolutely horrible. Um, I, I, I just wonder, uh, Kenneth had mentioned that there are uh, 10 other individuals on death row in Texas who are convicted under the law and party, are the law and parties. And I know, Merdula, you are uh, in Arizona. Is there a law of parties in Arizona? I mean, how common is this ridiculous law? Um, there are several other states that have a lot. I would, I would guess something like 15 or so states that allow the death penalty under these circumstances. Arizona is one of them, and actually the Supreme Court case in which the the court in 1987 expanded the the death penalty was out of Arizona, and that's kind of the basis for allowing people who are who are convicted under the law of parties to be sentenced to death. Now it's an Arizona case, so we're not we're not doing great on this front either. Um, but I don't think you know what from the uh, death penalty information center. It seems that there are, the actual executions of people under this law are very infrequent and that they mostly occur in Texas. So Texas, once again, seems to be a bit of a special and terrible beast when it comes to the death penalty. Terrible beast indeed. I think we have Joanne back. Joanne, can we hear you? No. No. Um, well, I wanted to talk to Joanne um, about the actual law of parties in Texas, her organization, um, the families against the, the Texas law of parties have been working really hard to um, to repeal this law. As Kenneth said, it dates back to pre before the death penalty was actually instituted um, nationwide in, in, in the mid 70s. Uh, Daniel, do you do you know if there I know there's a, a piece of legislation that has been kicked around in the Texas legislature to repeal or if not repeal outright to to structurally change some of the net, efficiencies in containment law. Do you have any idea now that we've just had these midterm elections and we have some new people who've come into legislatures and some old people who've been booted out that this has any opportunity or any way to kind of weave its way up into the governor's signature? I haven't heard of a, a kind of a that potential that that bill becoming suddenly closer to passing. Um, but I'm not an expert on that. I, I do know that Kenneth took a lot of hope from what happened in California, which is that um, it is now no longer possible to sentence someone to death for, you know, under this this idea of vicarious responsibility. Absolutely. Heidi Moan. Uh, Heidi Isabel. Hello. How are you doing? She writes that she believes the law of parties is a cheap shot at the law, uh, one that kills the truth. Uneven sentences, and sometimes it leads to murderers walking away. Absolutely true. Um, and please keep on sending in your comments and questions. I wanted to go back to Medulla for another quick question. Um, speaking of our, our, our somewhat encouraging uh, midterm elections, um, from an abolition standpoint, uh, we saw some some strong abolitionists being uh, abolitionists being elected to higher office. Um, the governor, incoming governor of Colorado, has signaled already that if there is a, a, a bill that comes his way to abolish the death penalty, he will sign it. Uh, the incoming governor-elect of Kansas, 
um, was a lead pusher of the abolition bill that made its way up into the governor's desk and then was vetoed. Now that she's in control, we might be able to see some activity there as well. Um, do you feel there is any shift in the state of Texas, judicial, legal-wise, attitude-wise, with regards to the death penalty, or uh, are we just back here at ground zero with regard to Texas? Um, I wish I could say I see a clear shift. Uh, I'm hopeful for a lot of the new judges who came in in Texas. There is just a, a whole new wave of judges and some new DAs who I think might be a little bit more careful or prudent about when they choose to to uh, pursue capital charges. Um, we have seen on kind of narrower issues like the issue of junk science, the courts in Texas really taking note and also the legislature there and really trying to push back when they feel that someone has been convicted based on really unsound forensic testimony. Um, and, you know, I'm always hopeful that one of these days the, the a bill narrowing the law of parties will, will pass. And I think, um, I believe that it's going to be uh, sponsored again this year and I'm hopeful, but um, I don't think Texas is rushing toward abolition. I don't see any sign of that. Well, you don't need them to rush, but if they can make a slow walk, progress. Um, right. that would be, I think that would be considered progress. And, I've been, and I'm certain that Joanne's organization is out there on the front lines making sure mm -hmm. that all these people know. We were shocked when we put this up on a poll and we're gonna put this up on a poll on Twitter um, just so people can start the Twitter dialogue around this. We're shocked that people have no idea that actually you can be sentenced to death um, for not being convicted of actually killing someone. And that just shocks the American people. And I believe it's when we start to feel all of these real issues about the death penalty, um, whether it's people who haven't, who are innocent of actually murder or people with um, limited mental capacity or people who have ineffective counsel, or people who just straight out innocent um, and, and not even co close to being um, guilty of the crimes that they've been charged with. I think when we get these stories out into the mainstream, they begin to chip away of the attitudes that people have with the death penalty. I think people's belief that the criminal justice system is infallible is declining on a rapid basis. Daniel, you're a criminal justice reporter. How do you feel that people are looking at criminal justice now from this lens of, you know, Black Lives Matter and police brutality and all these things? Do you feel that there is a shift out there nationwide um, in a way that we're, we're reviewing the criminal justice system? Yes, I, I'm, I'm heartened at the moment by the rise of the Marshall Project, the appeal, um, even the new season of Serial, I think, does a, a pretty decent job at um, looking at the criminal justice system and its and the systematic ways in which it's broken. Um, at the same time, I think that old narratives, um, the kind of murder mystery narrative and the um, like, the the crime channel style storytelling, is still around. Um, Chris Cuomo, uh, the CNN host, is is currently doing this show called Inside Evil. And I think the framing of that, even, even though that show can have some, some fascinating moments, the framing of that show automatically assumes that someone is evil. Mm -hmm. um, the show that, that featured Kenneth and that has attracted a lot of people to his case was called I Am, I am Killer. Yeah, I Am Killer, right. Which is a very stigmatizing way to begin a narrative. And I think we have to watch out for something, which is that Kenneth in that show was... Um, described as a killer under the law or in the eyes of the law. So he's being defined as a different kind of incarcerated person who's maybe less guilty than everybody else on death row or who was formerly on death row. And I think we gotta be careful of that, defining some incarcerated people as good and others as not worthy of um, you know, lesser punishment or, or being taken off, the death, off of death row. And we're going we're gonna to dive into that a little bit about uh, the way that the, the mainstream media or the influx of media has maybe affected the public opinion with regard to the death penalty and criminal justice. Well, we have a question from Leah Raja. I'm not sure where Leah is from, but thank you for your question. She writes to either one of you. I'll, take, I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys decide which one you want to take it. Currently, what do you believe is the most viable avenue to revise or get rid of the law parties altogether? Do you think it's more people understanding that people are convicted under the law 
um, or, or having been uh, charged guilty under the law? Do you believe it's what um, uh, Kenneth said in the beginning, that the law was instituted way before the death penalty was even a factor, so it shouldn't be a factor in the death sentence? Or do you think it's a combination, or do you think it's not going anywhere? Do you want to go first? Maybe I'll go second on this one. <laughs> okay. Um, I yeah, I think this is a, a an issue of people not knowing, as you've pointed out. People don't know how I'm going to say easily you could be sentenced to death, um, and that if you if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, or you, if you do something like commit a robbery and it goes too far, you have a bad lawyer uh, and, a, and a harsh prosecutor, you could be on death row. It's People don't know that. And when they do, and when people start um, being activists on this front, then DAs will hear about it. And DAs in Texas, they're publicly elected officials. They will react when people tell them, like, I don't want people in my county to be prosecuted for these kind of crimes. And if the DA is not responsive, that person will be pushed out of office. Um, and we'll see that too with state legislators. I think I think a, a very vocal public response about the law of parties will get people uh, in positions of power moving. And I'm, I think we're generally headed in that direction in Texas and in the country. And I'm hopeful that we'll see some response from the people who can actually make the high level statutory changes and the prosecutorial uh, decision making changes soon. Well, we are all- than later. We're, we're equally hopeful as well, and we share your optimism. Uh, Daniel, uh, anything to chime in on that? I guess I just wanted to zoom in on a couple, uh, you know, on, on an observation that Radula made. Um, I guess there's three levels that I'm hearing. One level is the law of parties could be outlawed. A new law could be passed to restrict it or to get rid of it. Another level is that it could be reinterpreted, um, and it could, you know, you could challenge the ability of uh, the courts to to sentence someone to death, for example. Uh, and another is that it can just be ignored. Prosecutors do not have to sentence someone under the law of parties, even though that law exists. And I think all of these levels can, can be pursued at the same time. Thank you so much. That's great. Uh, Daniel, let's let's uh, let's circle back to what we we're talking about with regard to the media. Um, I know in recent months we've seen an influx of media, whether TV shows like you mentioned on Netflix, I Am Killer. Uh, there was a network show over the summer um, co-produced by Oscar winner Viola Davis called The Last Defense, which did a deep dive into the, the Darley Rudier case. Um, and we've seen more and more of these cases, whether they're in the real life dramas, as you were talking about, um, kind of focus in on the death row, the death penalty and death row inmate. Do you think this attention is good? Um, do you think it's a bad thing for the movement to have these stories out there, especially the way that some of them are being negatively framed? Or do you think that any time that we're talking about the death penalty is a good time because, well, not a good time, but a good thing, because we're able to put the actual truth and the facts out into the public domain? I would say it's potentially good, and it's, it's up to us as citizens to help um, challenge the framing so that the narrative is not automatically assuming someone is evil, uh, not automatically assuming that someone is should be thought of as a killer. Um, I think that exposure is a good thing, but it's only a starting point. And the narrative that um, most people on death row deserve to be there, and someone like Kenneth Foster is an outlier, that's a dangerous narrative that I think storytelling can help storytelling and, and journalism and documentary filmmaking can help to challenge. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Merdula, I believe there was a, I don't know if it was a movie or a film or a TV show, but there was something about the Texas Seven that was uh, made into uh, a, a television show or a movie, correct? Uh, there have been a few documentaries and TV shows about the Texas Seven, including a Werner Herzog piece. So, yes. yes. And, and did, in, in looking back on that, um, do you feel that that has helped your case for Joseph, hurt your case for Joseph, made people realize exactly what he's being um, held for? Um, I don't think they've been particularly helpful. Um, there are some factual inaccuracies that 
later people treat as as the truth when we're like, well, no, this is contradicted by evidence on the record, by the police reports, by other things that we can point to that are that are more reliable than a documentary. Um, it is, and also, I mean, the fact that this was a pretty notorious crime. It's, uh, I think, the the viewpoint of the the person creating the show, the documentarian, really matters. So whether it's like, are, are you trying to shed light on the problems with the death penalty or are you just trying to sensationalize this crime? That's a, those are two very different goals from the point of the people who are making the program. So I think there was a little bit more sensationalization happening in Joseph's case and less shedding light on the issues that uh, that arose with this case for, for many of the co-defendants with the law of parties and the kind of expansive use of the death penalty and how much the media played a role in the the kind of outrage over this crime. Absolutely. Uh, coming from the chat, Jackie Gartland says, I think sometimes police and prosecutors pick on easy targets in order to make themselves look good and to win votes. So they go after people like Jeff Wood or they go after people like Joseph Garcia or other people, some who have mental problems and intellectual um, disabilities. Um, Robert Mead, who um, says that she lost her loved one um, on May 4th, 2018, when Texas executed him for a crime that he did not commit. And she says the law in Texas is called party to a crime. And Ron Clean says the law of parties benefits absolutely no one except the prosecutor who gets to use a non-murderer to further his or her career or his or her lust for human sacrifice. Um, all very much true. And of course, uh, our good friend, um, they're all flying in here now. Um, uh, and Sherry Good once again chimes in saying, Warner Herzog is not helpful at all in any case. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to disagree. I not agree with you more on that one. Uh, keep the comments going in. Please don't forget to stick around to the end of the webinar. We'll be doing some calls of action and really hoping that you can use your voice to further advance the need to uh, abolish the death penalty. But um, before we wrap up, I wanted to say, unfortunately, Robin Bean was not able to get back onto the system. Um, we really wanted to have some good questions about what was going on on the ground with regards to the law parties in Texas. So if you're able to go look up their organization, it's called Families Against the Texas Law of Parties and see how you can maybe help them communicate the need to reevaluate this law and maybe outright repeal it and see if you can get involved. Uh, Daniel Gross, you can always read him or catch him in the New Yorker, uh, BBC World Service. Um, you can hear his audio um, on NPR. Go to his website, I believe it is www.degrowth.org degrowth.org for a list of a long stuff, a bunch of content up there. And thank you again for uh, facilitating that message with uh, Kenneth Foster and for participating here with us today. Uh, Radula Rahman, I'm going to give you the last word since you are, uh, you got a big, you got a, you got a big thing on your plate. Um, what do you want to leave us with and, and, and let us know what we can do. We're going to be talking about it a little bit later on um, at the end, but tell us how we can help. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of our team and especially on Joseph's behalf. Uh, just so appreciative of the support and the interest in Joseph's case and in his life and the dedication to this like, deeply important cause. Um, as I mentioned, we have a clemency application pending and we expect a decision on Friday. So if folks are interested, they can contact the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles. Just give them a call um, and let them know that you don't support the execution of someone who neither killed nor intended to kill anyone. You can also contact the governor of Texas um, who's involved in the clemency process. We've been in touch with Lucy Villarreal at the office of the general counsel. And I believe the attorney assigned to this case is Corey Liu. And just let them know, reach out, let them know that this is the kind of case that demands clemency. Um, Joseph will spend the rest of his life in prison and that is punishment enough for his own actions and his own intents. And I think more broadly, um, especially in Texas, but really in a number of states, you can contact your legislators and let them know that 
the felony murder rule as it exists or the law of parties it needs to go. We, we're better than that as a society. And if we're not, we should aim to be. Um, in Texas, especially representative, state representatives Canales and Dutton and Leach are especially interested in this issue. So you should reach out to them in particular and let them know you support their efforts to narrow the law of parties. And um, I just keep on fighting the good fight. And as Joseph has, has uh, been saying recently, keep on dancing. So keep on keep on fighting the good fight and keep on dancing. Those are good words of wisdom for all of us. Um, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Um, Radula, thank you, uh, Joanne, um, for what was a very educational, informative conversation, and we appreciate your time. Um, and now is the time to take action. Um, and we need you to help abolish the death penalty because you are our justice. Um, now I'm going to give you four calls to action so you can make a difference in our movement. And at the end of the uh, presentation, I'll be posting various links to some of the action items that I'm, I'm talking about so you can access them. Um, our first call to action – sorry about that – our first call to action – is that we want you to share these JPIA webinars because um, they are an important way to help build the movement. Um, later on, I'm going to be posting some links that you can share through our YouTube page, and you can also always join us on social. Second, um, we'd love for you to donate to NCADP because this is what makes our work possible. Um, you can donate once at a time, or you become a torchbearer by setting up an automated monthly donation. Three, join the NCADP Volunteer National Action Team and become on the front lines of our legislative battles, our fundraising pushes, and our community service opportunities like the organization of screenings of a new documentary film called In the Execution of Shadow. You can sign up at AD NCADP Action or you can email me directly at action at ncadp.org. And lastly, Please use your voice. Uh, as we said, on December 4th, Joseph Garcia is scheduled to be executed by the state of Texas, and we can stop this execution. Please call the number on this graphic or on the slide and call Governor Abbott and tell him to stop the execution. And for more information on Joseph's case and other death row inmates facing execution, you can visit the NCADB, NCADP execution alerts page um, to find out how you can get further involved. And like I said, as soon as I'm wrapped up here, I'm going to be posting all the links that I mentioned into the chat room so you can access them. So there it is, guys. Thank you so much for attending our November webinar. Uh, we're going to be back in December with another edition of the NCADP presented JPIA webinar series. Until then, like Joseph said, keep up the fight and keep dancing. Thank you so much. Thank you.